meeting of the First Friday <coughs> Colloquium, um, which is sponsored by the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy in our college, College of Education and Ecology. Um, we are very excited to have Sarah Shopee Sullivan with us today, um, Associate Professor in Human Development and Family Studies, who is going to talk to us about co-parenting. Um, and I haven't, I'm not privy to the talk, so I can't give you any sort of spoilers in advance. It's a surprise. No. It's all a surprise. <laughs> um, as we did last month, and we'll be doing this again next month, and hopefully we'll, you're on our email list so you can keep coming. We love um, seeing everybody here. Um, Sarah will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for discussion. And last time we came together, there was really interesting discussion. Um, we did have pizza coming. It is a little bit late um, because the government is shut down <laughs> for reasons we don't understand. But um, pizza will probably show up in about 30 minutes, and if you're starving, get up and just grab something, but don't do it in mass or it'll become chaotic in here. So I will turn it over to Sarah then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm really excited to be talking to you about my research on co-parenting and young children's social and emotional development. Some research that I've been doing for about the past uh, 15 years. So just to give you a little sense of what I do and how co-parenting fits into all of this, um, my research has three main areas of focus. The first is on co-parenting, which obviously I'll be talking about today. Um, and co-parenting can be generally defined as the extent to which parents cooperate as a team in rearing children. I also have interest in father-child relationships, and you'll hear a little about that today. I'm particularly interested in variations in father-child relationships across families. It turns out that fathers are highly variable in how involved they are with their children and what they do in terms of parenting. And so I'm really interested both in what the implications of those variations are for children's development and also why those variations exist and where they come from, why some fathers are much more involved with their children than others are. And then the third area of focus for me is the transition to parenthood. So co-parenting and father-child relationships really develop as parents become parents for the first time over this transition. And so I've done some research on that uh, big life change. If anybody here is a parent, you know that it's a, as, as much as many people or some people try to prepare for it, it's not something you can entirely prepare for. The guiding theory or framework for my research is family systems theory. And according to family systems theory, families consist of interdependent parts or subsystems. So basically, people can't really be understood separately from relationship context and family context. Okay? The idea is that people affect each other. Okay? Um, another principle of family systems theory is this idea that the family whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay, so as I'm going to be talking to you about, I study co-parenting, which usually involves two parents and one child. And you couldn't know what that's like in a family just by knowing something about the individuals in the family or even like the father-child relationship and the mother-child relationship. That, that, they're di that the whole of the family or different levels of the family are something greater. And also, according to family systems perspectives, family systems reorganize at transitions, like the transition to parenthood, when new relationships or new family subsystems are formed. So what do I mean by co-parenting? Like I said, co-parenting can be roughly defined as the extent to which parents work as a team and cooperate in rearing children versus they don't work well together and they work at cross purposes to each other. Um, so, but to give you a, a visual here, here's a diagram of a very oversimplified family system. I know that. Um, but here we have a mother, father, and child. And these double-headed arrows here represent the more typically studied dyadic or two-person relationships in families. Um, so here you have like the couple relationship that uh, between parents, if they're romantically involved, right, married, cohabiting. Um, and mother-child relationship and father-child relationship. Okay, that's what's typically studied um, in research and especially in, in developmental psychology. Um, what I mean by co-parenting is really something more like this. So it's really a triadic or a three-person relationship, um, the relationship between parents with respect to parenting the child. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm talking about here. 
And importantly, according to family systems theory, this co-parenting relationship, sometimes called the executive subsystem of the family, so think about like the, you know, the, the corp board of the corporation or something that's controlling, the, the, you know, that's, that's uh, leading the family, um, is very important, is critical to the health and well-being of family members, especially children. And also, this is considered to be something different from just this couple relationship here. Okay, not just in the sense that co-parenting is related to parenting issues, because you say, well, okay, you got the co-parenting issues, right, and then you got all the other couple issues. You've got finances and sex and um, all that kind of stuff. It's not just that, because the idea of co-parenting is really, like I said, that it's triadic, that you're involving the child, okay, and it's not just between the two uh, adults in the family. So why would I study this? Well, I could give you a whole, I don't have time in 45 minutes to give you the whole long uh, personal story of why I find this interesting, but um, there are some practical reasons, you know, besides the fact that family systems theory says the co-parenting relationship or, or ex executive subsystem is important. The first point is, is that most children are parented by more than one adult at any given time in their lives. Okay, some would say that I'm a developmental psychologist by training that we created the single parent family long before it really existed. And some would even argue that, I mean, there are certainly lots of children, I believe it's over 40%, um, we last look, are born to unmarried mothers, that is true. But even for unmarried mothers, uh, about 60% of them are living with the child's father at the time of the child's birth. So even though they're not married, it's not as if there, there aren't multiple parental figures in children's lives. And also, even though I will um, say that the research I'm going to be focusing on today tip mostly involves married male-female parents, Co-parenting itself is a really broad construct, it's a really broad idea that can apply to all different kinds of families, okay? So people have studied co-parenting between mothers and grandmothers in families, and also certainly studied co-parenting um, for uh, gay and lesbian parents, adoptive parents, step-parents. There's a huge co-parenting uh, focus in the divorce literature, obviously, so this is a pretty broad construct. And so co-parenting really represents a significant reality for children. Most of them are receiving parenting by more than one adult at any given time. And also, um, there is quite a lot of research, including some of my own, to suggest that the quality of the co-parenting relationship in the family is critical to father's involvement with children. So if the co-parenting relationship is good, if it's supportive, and especially if mothers are supportive of fathers, fathers are more involved with their children. And this is true in families headed by married parents, but it's also likely even more true in, uh, with unmarried parents, because unmarried fathers' ties to their children are, are quite tenuous. So these are some of the reasons why um, I focus on the study of co-parenting. Okay, so again, to give you a, more of an idea of the components of the co-parenting construct, so what do I mean by, you know, parents cooperate and they don't get in each other's way? What does that mean? Um, this is a sort of amalgamation of a couple of different models of co-parenting that researchers have put out. It's really currently how I think about it. And in this model, um, this conceptual model, co-parenting consists of four components. The first one is solidarity, and that is really agreement about child-rearing beliefs and values and the sense that you gr you're growing together as parents versus parenthood is like pushing you up further apart. There are also these two components, support and undermining, and these are really very behavioral. Support has to do with instrumental and emotional support between partners with respect to parenting, whereas undermining is the flip side. Undermining is uh, basically hostile, critical, competitive behavior between uh, partners with respect to parenting a common child. And then we also have this component down here, which I won't have much time to talk about today. That's division of labor. And it's really parents' happiness or satisfaction with how the child rearing jobs are being divided. Okay, so it's not just how they're being split up between, in this case, moms and dads, but how satisfied parents are with that division. It turns out to be a very contentious issue for new, new parents. So most of my research has focused on these two components of co-parenting, the supportive and undermining components. And I said these are very behavioral, and I do a lot of observational research. So I'm really interested in stuff that you can see happen when you, uh, when you watch uh, parents interact together uh, in parenting their children. And so what I typically do in my research is I take families, uh, triads, mother, father, child, 
And I put them in a variety of structured and semi-structured situations, both at home and in a lab. And I asked them to do things together with their child. Sometimes I asked the parents to just play together with their child as they normally would if they had some extra time. Um, and sometimes I asked them to do something a little bit harder, a little bit uh, more structured or goal-oriented, like, okay, I would like you to uh, use this building set together and create, uh, create a structure together. Or we'd like you to play a game together or draw a picture of your family together. So these are the kinds of things that I've done. Um, obviously with infants, you do more like just play with your baby <laughs> as you would if you had a few extra minutes. And then with, uh, as kids get older into the preschool years, we do more of this goal-oriented kind of stuff. And then these um, interactions between moms, dads, and kids are videotaped and coded for important aspects of co-parenting behavior, in this case, supportive and undermining behavior. And so some of these important aspects of the behaviors, um, in terms of supportive co-parenting, um, to get a high score on supportive co-parenting, we want parents to show pleasure. And this is not just to be happy in general, but to show pleasure and appreciation of your partner's relationship with the child. Okay, to be attentive and engaged when your partner is taking the lead, you know, to compliment your partner and what they're doing with the child, those sorts of things. Warmth, uh, genuine affection and connection between parents with respect to parenting. Cooperation or, again, this kind of instrumental help and support. So if one parent says something to the child, you know, is trying to get the three-year-old to do something, the other parent says the same thing, like echoes it or said, oh, your mom's right, or yeah, you better, you better do that, you know, or, or just trying to, to smoothly work together uh, with their child. And then interactiveness, which is really just, in, again, engaging with your partner in the task of parenting the child. So, um, you know, responding to what the other person says and looking at them and so forth. On the other hand, uh, families that got high scores on undermining co-parenting show behaviors like displeasure, coldness, anger, and competition. Displeasure is showing dislike or disdain for your partner's parenting strategies or efforts to work with a child. Coldness is basically kind of stonewalling, not responding to your partner if they say something about the child or if they make an observation about the child, so forth. Anger, irritation, which we see sometimes is how annoyed are you at your, what your partner's doing with the child. And then competition, which is I think one of the most interesting behaviors, which is when parents um, either compete for their child's affection or attention um, while uh, in these uh, situations. And so what I thought I would do is show you some examples of some families so you can see what this looks like. So uh, the first family I'm gonna show you is a family, these are from an older study now, so the videos aren't great quality, but I think you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, these were families with three-year-olds, okay? And what we asked them to do is we asked them to build a structure together out of Lincoln Logs, okay? If you know what Lincoln Logs are. It turns out those are great because they're really pretty hard for little kids to, to use appropriately. and Actually hard for lots of adults to use appropriately too. So, so it provides some, um, some, you know, it, it brings out a lot of variability in how uh, the parents uh, manage this co-parenting task. And so the first example of this family that you'll see uh, with their three-year-old, um, they were rated very high on supportive co-parenting on those elements I just showed you. So in this example, the parents draw attention to each other's activities. They support each other, like I want, uh, just an example, the mom says, oh, daddy's right. Um, and the parents repeat each other's directions to the child. Okay, so I don't know how hard this will be for you to hear, but we'll give it a shot. And I think as a result, you can see they do a very nice job of building, in this case, we asked them, it was a playground set, so we asked them to build the playground together. Okay, let me, I think I just have to click it. Let's see here.
Okay, so I'm going to cut that off in terms of time, and I know it's hard to hear, but basically they're ec constantly echoing each other's recommendations about how to proceed with building the structure. And the mom's taking a little bit more supportive role and the dad's leading, but they're still uh, interacting with each other and um, supporting each other's efforts with the child. So here's a different example of a very different family. This is an example of undermining co-parenting with a three-year-old. Same study, same situation that the parents were asked to, um, in which they were asked to build a structure together. What you can see here is that dad takes over the task and criticizes mom's efforts. He repeatedly says, mommy did it all backwards. And he continues to criticize mom. He calls her building challenged. And I don't know if you can hear this, but by the end, the three-year-old is calling her mother uh, building challenged as well. So it's really pretty nasty um, for, for what we see in these kinds of observations. So, um, and I do have permission to show these, by the way, in <laughs> academic presentations. <laughs> okay. It's really hard to hear. He says, you're building challenge, that's for sure. Okay, so we go a little later. They're fighting again over how to do this. She play hits him. <laughs> There she goes. Is your building challenge? And she said, "Daddy just got impatient and had to take over." So you get the idea um, here. Yeah. So basically, I don't know if you it got caught that whole last exchange, but too like um, the. Uh, Mom was said to the child, Daddy needs a doink, doesn't he? Which means like a hit, basically, you know, a bonk on the head. And the child says, no, you, you need a doink. You know, and actually later she actually um, hits her mom. Um, <laughs> not hard, but you know, this is not, these are not, we know that these are not good things. Okay. Okay. So what do these kinds of interactions mean for children's development? So in an early study, one of the early studies I did, um, what I was interested in was whether these kinds of different co-parenting interactions um, in families were related to children's adjustment, to children's social and emotional adjustment. Um, and so um, in this study where these videos were from, we had about 60 family triads, and they were studied when the child was three, that's when the co-parenting was assessed, and one year later when children were four, we obtained reports of children's social emotional adjustment from parents, but also from children's preschool teachers. And very simply, not surprisingly, this is what we found. That when parents showed more supportive co-parenting, like that first family when children were three, um, by both parent and teacher reports, children showed fewer behavior problems, um, in particular, fewer externalizing or aggressive acting out behavior problems one year later. And in contrast, when uh, parents showed more, were more like the second family and showed higher levels of undermining co-parenting, children showed more uh, externalizing behavior problems one year later, both by parent report and by teacher report. Okay, so that helped to provide some early evidence that co-parenting might be important for children's development. Um, some of my own research and subsequent work by other 
scholars, has really um, honed in on this idea and demonstrated that co-parenting has uh, unique effects on children. So even when controlling for the general quality of the couple relationship, you know, outside of parenting, um, controlling for the quality of mother-child and father-child relationships, and uh, it, just very recently, my students and I submitted um, an abstract to a conference where we showed that even controlling for uh, the infant's temperament or sort of inborn emotional behavioral tendencies, that the quality of the co-parenting relationship predicted toddler social-emotional adjustment above and beyond infant temperament. So it really does seem to be important for children's development, at least in the ways that we can study this sort of thing. So the next question I was interested in, though, was uh, to try to get more sense of the role of co-parenting in the family system. And I wanted to know in particular whether co-parenting moderated associations between child and family characteristics and child adjustment. And what I mean by this was, does the co-parenting environment in the family strengthen or weaken the relations between other things that we know affect children's development, um, th those kinds of associations? So I'm going to talk to you, if I have time, we'll see, about uh, two studies that address this question. In the first study, um, this was actually the first study I conducted at Ohio State um, when I got here, I uh, had 100 family triads, so a uh, mother, father, and a preschool-aged child, and I studied them when the child was age four, and then again a year later when the child was age five. Um, and we collected a lot of important information from these families, uh, information about uh, the parents' involvement, um, mothers' and fathers' involvement collected through surveys, information about children's characteristics from parents and from teachers, and then also these observations of co-parenting, an aspect of the family environment. And so in this first particular study, what I was interested in was this, um, this child characteristic called child effortful control. So this is uh, thought to be an aspect of temperament or these sort of innate, you know, at least innately influenced biological tendencies of children, kind of like the child's inborn personality is how I would describe it. And effortful control specifically is an aspect of temperament that has to do with the ability to control one's emotions and behavior, okay? And what we know from a lot of prior research about this is that children with low effortful control are at risk. They're at risk for lots of things, but especially at risk for developing these externalizing or aggressive acting out behavior problems, okay? Lots of studies have, have showed that association, okay? What I wanted to see was whether the quality of co-parenting behavior in the family could make a difference, could either strengthen or weaken this association that we know exists, okay? So basically this has to do with the role of co-parenting as a moderator of this association. And, um, I know I'm glossing over a lot of details. I'd be happy to answer questions about the analysis or if anybody has them. Um, but essentially, we did find that co-parenting, specifically supportive co-parenting, served as a moderator. So let me explain this. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, um, this was the moderation or interaction effect that we found when parents, this red line here with the triangles, when parents showed low levels of supportive co-parenting, when we observed them, okay, we saw the expected negative association between effortful control and externalizing behavior over time. And this was externalizing behavior at preschool reported by teachers, okay? So basically, kids low in effortful control were at risk for greater relative increases in externalizing behavior one year later, just what you'd expect, okay, based on prior research. But in the case when parents showed high levels of supportive co-parenting, what you can see is that association was not present. Then effortful control, whether kids were low or high, was not associated with relative increases or de decreases in externalizing behavior over one year's time. So we thought this was really promising. This is probably my favorite finding ever because usually you always find that bad things predict bad things, you know? That's, all, that's like what I feel like my research always says <laughs> is that if family is bad, the kids are having some bad outcomes. So this was very positive and it suggests that Co-parenting, uh, supportive co-parenting could be kind of a buffer in the family. It's, this is sometimes this type of effect in a, from a risk resilience perspective is called a protective stabilizing effect, that it might have a protective effect, at least in the short term, on kids who might be at risk for externalizing behavior problems. So using data from the same study, um, the next uh, inv uh, examination that or the next question we addressed, I should say, 
was again about this role of co-parenting as a moderator, but instead of as a moderator between a child characteristic and child adjustment, as a moderator of the association between another aspect of the family system and children's adjustment. In this case, we were interested in whether co-parenting moderated the association between father's involvement, the frequency of father's involvement in play with their preschool children, which is something fathers um, do do um, a fair amount of. And um, we wondered whether the effect of father's involvement in play on children's adjustment, social and emotional adjustment, would be moderated by the quality of co-parenting in the family. And why were we thinking this? Well, basically, I had done some other research suggesting that father's involvement was not always positive for families, okay? It actually sometimes was um, increased conflict between parents. And so, it, kind of counterintuitive, but I think if you give it some more thought, that's not really that counterintuitive. You know, anytime you've got more than one person involved in doing something, there's more possibility for support, but there's also more possibility for conflict, right? And so what that led me to think is maybe the father's involvement will be most likely to, be su to support the child's adjustment when the co in the context of a supportive, positive co-parenting relationship. And there are a lot of findings from that study, but I'm focusing on, on the two moderation effects here. So in this case, what you can see is that this is just like what we expected. Um, when there was high positive co-parenting in the family, so this is a combination of support and undermining, high support and low undermining behavior that we observed. When there's high positive co-parenting, the more fathers played with their preschoolers, the greater the relative decreases over time in the preschoolers internalizing behaviors. These are things like depress depressive, withdrawn, anxious behaviors, okay? But when, when co-parenting wasn't positive, you see that there was no association between how frequently the father played with the child and the child's internalizing behavior. So it seemed in this case that you know, fathers who were highly involved in play, in the context of a, of a uh, positive, supportive co-parenting relationship, their children benefited from, from that. We found something similar but a little bit different with respect to predicting preschoolers social competence. Again, this was reported by teachers so in the, in the preschool classroom. Um, in the case of high positive co-parenting, we found just what you'd think. So when families, uh, parents were supportive of each other's parenting and fathers played more with their preschoolers, those children showed greater, uh, <coughs> relatively greater increases in social competence over a year as reported by teachers. So again, the combination of high positive co-parenting and in fathers who are spending a lot of time playing with their preschoolers seem to uh, yield the best outcomes for children, right? We found something a little bit funny with respect to low positive co-parenting. So in families that showed more undermining and less supportive co-parenting, actually the more frequently fathers played with their children, the lower, uh, or the, the lower their social competence basically over one year. It was interesting because we, we really expected that to be flat and not, um, and not in that direction. But I think there's some possible explanations for this. Um, one would be that um, what's going on in a family where the father is really doing a lot with the child and there's the co-parenting is poor. I mean, there could be a lot of things going on that we couldn't even observe in terms of parents like disparaging each other's parenting when they're alone with the child, um, which is not something that you can easily get at in observations, although we do have survey measures to get at that. Or it could just be that, you know, the, the effect of the co-parenting relationship is so strong that if there's a lot of conflict and undermining going on in that relationship, it basically, can, you know, cancels out the beneficial effects of uh, father's involvement in play. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you a little bit that co-parenting might be important for children's development. Um, so I want to tell you a little, uh, change gears a little bit and tell you about some of my most recent research in which I've been studying the development of co-parenting relationships. Um, like I said, I'm interested in the transition to parenthood and finding that co-parenting might be important for children's development and also if becoming a parent myself just made me really, really interested in how co-parenting relationships develop. For, um, initially developed over the transition to parenthood. And so I, I'm probably going to rock your world a little bit with some of this stuff, but um, <laughs> I was interested in whether the co-parenting relationship actually starts to develop prior to the child's birth. I mean, we do know that parents develop representations of future family relationships before the birth of a child, so this is not completely crazy. Um, or at least that, you know, 
uh, predictors of the co-parenting relationship could be uh, identified prior to a child's birth because the earlier you can identify families that might have difficulties in the area of co-parenting, potentially the earlier you could intervene with them, right? And then also, though, an important issue, if you could identify something like the co-parenting relationship before a child even comes on the scene, an important issue would be since there's no actual, you know, at least outside world child there yet, right? Um, the important thing would be to be sure to distinguish that developing co-parenting relationship from that pre-existing couple relationship. You know, how could you really make that distinction? Once a child's born and you're saying it's triadic versus dyadic, I think it's, it's easier for people to grasp that. But what if you're just talking about these two people? Can you get a sense of their co-parenting relationship developing separately from their pre-existing uh, couple relationship? And so in order to address some of these questions, um, my colleague Claire Camp Dush and I embarked on a study, a much larger study, of parents undergoing the transition of parenthood. And this is called the New Parents Project. This was funded by the National Science Foundation. And what we did was we followed um, dual earner couples over their first transition into parenthood. Okay, so you got to remember what kind of sample this is. Um, the reason we focused on dual earner couples is because I thought that um, I'm, like I said, I'm also interested in fathers' involvement. I was thinking that these would be families in which fathers would really need to be involved because these were families in which both parents were working full-time prior to the child's birth and both were at least planning to go back to work part-time after the child, child's birth. And there were um, four time points of data collection. We recruited the sample in the third trimester of pregnancy um, and then we followed them up at three months, six months, and nine months postpartum, and we used surveys, interviews, and observations. I'm going to focus on the observations here today. Um, but we have a lot of data, and we're still coding and analyzing it, so which might be going on for about forever um, at this point. I have a lot of recommendations, too. If you ever want to do a longitudinal study like this, I can tell you all the things not to do. <laughs> One thing that we um, used in the New Parents Project in order to get this idea of whether co-parenting starts to develop before a baby's born is a procedure called the Prenatal Law Center Trilog Club. And it was actually developed by researchers at the Center for Family Studies at the University of Lausanne, which is in Switzerland, right in the Swiss Alps there. I've been fortunate to go there for two times. I would, you know, in a heartbeat, take off and go now, because <laughs> it's so beautiful. I mean, it's, it's really the most beautiful place I think I've ever seen. Um, and uh, they developed this procedure to try to um, assess the developing co-parenting relationship. And as part of um, my um, the, the grant that was funded, I was able to go there and to be trained to use this procedure and incorporate it into the New Parents Project. In the prenatal loss and trilog play, or LTP as we like to call it, expectant parents are asked to imagine it's the first time they're meeting their baby. Okay, so we, we did this in their homes and we went to them and we said, okay, we're gonna, we made them do lots of things, but we said, okay, sit down. We're going to have you uh, imagine it's the first time you're meeting your new baby. And then they're, at, they're given a doll that has an undefined face and really undefined features, not applying any racial ethnic background, no gender. You'll see it on the video in a little bit. Um, and they were asked to play together with the baby in four parts. Um, first, one parent plays with the baby. Then the other parent plays with the baby. Then both play together with the baby. And then they're asked to let the baby go to sleep in this little cute little basket and uh, talk together about their experience. And studies in Europe have shown that how parents uh, interact in this prenatal observation predicts elements of family interaction all the way up to child age five. So that was why, it wasn't just I thought it was neat, that was part of the reason why I thought it would be fruitful to include in the New Paris project. But nobody had ever used it in the US before. Okay. So here's an example. Um, this is a family that, um, actually this is on our website, I'll show you the link at the end if you want to look at some of the other videos from the New Paris project. Um, one of my undergraduate students got a grant to create a video uh, website about the observational methods in the New Parents Project. And so this is a family that is so cute that basically we asked them special permission to put their video on our website. So um, <laughs> they are really, really cute. And it's cut a little bit, so it's pretty short. But you'll get the idea. Now we're going to ask you to do some role playing basics so that the parents actually find it to be fun. Um, we need you to imagine the moment when the three of you meet for the first time after the delivery. Four parts. 
first one of you um, plays with the baby alone, then the other one plays with the baby alone. So please play with the baby together and tell me what him or her will see and talk together about the experience you just went through. Okay. Hi, baby. Aren't you cute? I bet your mommy and daddy are so excited to meet you. See, here they are. Here's your mommy. Here's your daddy. They don't play with you, so I'll put you down right here. And then, in the New Parents Project, we're going way ahead to the last assessment here, so I can tell you about one more study. But at nine months postpartum, um, when the, so when the infant's nine months old, we um, ask the parents to interact with their real baby, um, to actually introduce a new toy to them together, to, like one of the kinds of tasks I've already talked about, and those are coded for supportive and undermining co-parenting. So obviously, what I'm trying to do here is tell you about like one little piece of this. So, um, in an article that's uh, under review, what we did, um, structural equation modeling, like I said, if you want details, I will, I will be happy to provide them. This is obviously a massive oversimplification. But basically what we did is we looked at whether the prenatal co-parenting behavior in that situation with the doll predicted nine months postpartum, so about a year later, the supportive and undermining behavior we saw between parents with their real child. Okay. And we found that prenatal co-parenting behavior did in fact predict uh, better or higher quality prenatal co-parenting pr behavior predicted greater supportive and less undermining co-parenting a whole year later with a real baby. Okay. We also importantly controlled for another assessment, another measure which I couldn't show you, which was observed couple behavior. So those couples who were playing with the fake baby, we also asked them to, in a separate uh, observation on that same day to discuss a contentious issue in their couple relationship and those were coded for the quality of the couple relationship and so what's interesting is you can see that the prenatal co-parenting behavior predicted over and above the observed couple behavior although the observed couple behavior was also related which you'd expect from a family systems perspective which also predicted you know greater supportive and less undermining co-parenting um, a whole year later. We also included and controlled for measures of uh, 
parents' perceptions of their couple relationship, you know, their marital or, or couple sa satisfaction, how much they reported that they fought with each other and so forth. Those were not significantly associated with co-parenting behavior at nine months postpartum. Okay, getting close here. Okay, so the last thing I really want to show you, and I think we're almost done, so that's perfect. Um, is I thought to really hit this home, you know, get this hit home for you, I would show you an example of a family from the New Parents Project doing that prenatal LTP with a fake baby and then introducing their nine-month-old to a new toy together. So you can see the same family um, over time. And so, um, since you saw the really cute example of obviously very high quality prenatal co-parenting, I have an example of poor prenatal co-parenting. What you will see here is, and don't feel bad if you think this would have been you, because I know that I was really worried when I introduced this, this playing with the doll situation to American parents that they would just think it was ridiculous. That actually was not true on the whole. Um, but in this couple, they, they, they clearly do. The expectant parents cannot engage in the task. They look awkward. They show relatively low levels of intuitive parenting, like the mom throws the baby to the dad. And they show pretty low levels of genuine family warmth. They're laughing a lot, but it's because they're embarrassed and, and they think it's goofy and they don't really show true warmth and affection to each other. So you'll see um, here. <laughs> I mean, it is funny. Anyway, you get the idea. They're very different from the first uh, family you saw. Okay, so fast forward to, not literally, but okay. So nine months. So at nine months, um, they also showed poor real life co-parenting um, with their nine month old infant. What you'll see is that um, the parents work together with their child independently. So they're both playing with the child, introducing the child to this new toy, which is a jack in the box. Um, but they're not really cooperating or working together. And they show displeasure towards each other's parenting. So you'll hear mom say, you're not giving them a chance to explore it. Um, and they show competition. So they kind of fight over who gets to use the toy with the child. And at the end, you'll see them, like, they physically kind of pull on it. It's, it's when you think about it, it's kind of strange, actually. But, um, and he's just got this black box because I realized that he wore an identifying t-shirt. So I wanted to block that for him. So. Um,
because you take a turn. A lot of parents that are more supportive will like hold it together and they will do it, you know, together. They, um, whereas they're, they're more taking turns here, which is okay. She's trying to, she says he thinks he comes out and dad doesn't really respond. She like, yeah, she like whacked him there. They were fighting over the, yeah, jack in the box. Okay, so we're, we're at the end here and I'm out of time. So what uh, should you conclude from my presentation today? Um, I think first that co-parenting matters that we have evidence that this is an important aspect of families for children's development, as partic in particular social emotional development that co-parenting does not only have direct associations with children's adjustment, but that it also may serve as a, a buffer in terms of strengthening a buffer or an exacerbator, I guess, strengthen or weaken effects of other child and family characteristics on children's adjustment. And also that we have some evidence that co-parenting or at least some uh, develops prior to the child's birth or at least that we can identify you know, predictors of uh, co-parenting that are present prior to the child's birth. And thank you very much. <laughs>